Hello, everybody! So, today, we are going to take these books here and go through everything we need to be able to do Long Shot Poems for Broke Players by Charles Bukowski, put out by Seven Poets Press in the year of our Lord, I think 1961. I, I didn't have my notes open. I fucked up. In the year of our Lord, 1961. Again, this is from Seven Poets Press out of New York, um, edited by Carl Larson. A few notes on long shot poems for broke players. First off, up to date. Um, I think this is, it's his fourth chapbook, I think. Let me just check real quick here. So we had Signature 2, Signature 1, and um, Flower Fist, right? Okay. So there's another one called... Shit. I'm going to fuck this up. I think it's called Poems and Drawings. I don't know if that's necessarily considered one of his actual chapbooks. Regardless, I'll cover that if that's the next one in line. I can't remember if that's the one that might have come out around the same time as this, or if Run with the Hunted um, is the one that came out with this. So we'll we'll get to that in a bit here. Um, this one is pretty long compared to the other ones we've done. This has like 25 poems in it. And we're going to see something that we saw in pretty much every other chapbook of his and um probably will my guess is is that every other chapbook that comes out might have the same structure i would be curious about um what is it cold dogs in the courtyard and we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to it the way these poems are set up and this was not Bukowski's doing. This was the editors who put these chapbooks out. Um, it was all they're doing. And what I mean is, is that you'll have some poems in the beginning of the book that show, almost that show he belongs to the poetry community. And, he, um, and that the academics should accept him. And then we start getting into the nitty gritty of the different levels of the skid row drunk, um, poet of the streets, that whole thing before we come back around. Um, and this one does it pretty good. Now, um, there were, I think, five poems that have not been published anywhere else. But because of the amazing work that is done by the members of the Bukowski Forum at um, Bukowski.net, um, which I don't even know if it's still going. Um, I know I've brought this up before. I think the people that run it pulled the plug on it uh, as far as new posts go, but have left everything else up there um, for research purposes. And thank heaven for them because... A lot of this stuff we want to be able to find out otherwise. But um, I found all the poems that are from this collection going through those forums. So um, in this instance, I will be able to talk about all the poems. And um, the ones that aren't in the books that you can grab, um, I will put up for you guys to um, take a gander at the title. Long Shot Poems for Broke Players, um, and also has um, a cover by Bukowski, the art on it. Allegedly, the story goes, if you notice the cover and you notice the um, title page, I'll put those both up. The cover has poems misspelt. The title page has poems spelt the correct way. Allegedly, the typo is on the title page. Okay? So, the correct spelling of poems 
is the misprint. And the alleged bit here is, is that Bukowski spelt poems wrong on purpose to show the literary world that they're taking poetry too seriously. Do I believe this story? Sounds pretty accurate. Does it sound like something Bukowski would say? It does sound like something Bukowski would say. Could I also see Bukowski being drunk and writing the name of the book on the cover in Sharpie on the original artwork and spelling it wrong? I do. I can see that as well. If he did this to tell the literary world and the poetry community that they need to stop taking themselves so fucking seriously. That's fucking brilliant. And we need to be spelling poems wrong all the time. We need to spell poem wrong, poems, poetry, poet. So let's spell them all wrong. Um, because that is fucking brilliant. I love it. I fucking love it. Okay. So moving on. So the first poem in here, Bring Down the Beams, is in the Rooming House Madrigals, page 229. Now, if you notice, when I show the poems in here, because like I have lots of tags on these books, all the tags for the poems that are in Long Shot Poems of Broke Players are the ones on the top corners. So if you see, that's quite a bit. So if you want to read the majority of the poems that are in Longshot Poems for Broke Players, pick up Rooming House Magicals. They're in there. And you'll notice that this, especially with these early chat books, this has been the go-to book. Like, there's more stuff in here than in any other. I think the closest we got was The Days Run Away Like Wild Horses Over the Hills for Flower Fist. Um... But yeah, so these are all um, just for long shot poems here. Okay, this poem here. Um, oh, real quick. It was also in Hearse number four from 1959. And it's also collected on the poetry of Charles Bukowski Pacifica radio um, recording of him and fr that was released in 2008. As an opener, as an opening poem, this is kind of heavy. Um, I, I get it. I understand it. I understand why it's there. Um, because he talks about what an artist is and what an artist isn't. And throwing that in right off the bat to show the intellectuals, to show the academia, the literati, whatever you want to call it, the college profs, the whole deal... Um, it's kind of an important thing. And then also this poem takes place with him in, um, in an education situation. He's going to night school. He's taking an art class. Um, he name drops some artists, which will fall flat on the everyman, but won't fall flat on the academics. So that's like another feather in his cap there. Um, and then for edginess, this poem has it because he's talking about a homosexual in here and types out the word homosexual twice. So that's edgy for 1961. Um, so, I mean, this poem ticks all the boxes for a Bukowski poem to open a chapbook, especially when Bukowski um, wasn't that huge name in the poetry world that um, he would become within the next, probably from this point, probably the, within the next five years, like every poet on the planet would know who he was in that world. The next poem we have here is Candidate Middle of Left, Right, Center. Um, and the only other place that this was released 
was in the San Francisco Review number eight from 1961. I'm going to put two versions of this poem up because one of these versions is from Longshot Poems. Another version is from the San Francisco Review. And if you look, there are differences in these two poems, okay? Um, so you're going to notice that there are some differences here. I saw when I was going through the Bukowski Forum, people trying to figure out if these were edits by Bukowski or if these were edits by um, the editor of the San Francisco Review. What my guess is, is that edits were either asked of Bukowski from the San Francisco Review or Bukowski knew what the San Francisco Review puts in its pages and said, well, shit, this poem has some cussing in it. Um, that's probably not going to fly with the review. So um, I'm going to try to um, church this up before I send it in. And one of the reasons why he added lines instead of just taking lines out might be because if he got paid by the line, he's going to add lines if he could add lines. Second, if when he was submitting, if the submission said, we're looking for poems of blank many lines, and that happens, like, they'll be like, we're looking for poems um, that are 100 lines, and you get paid three cents a line or five cents a line or 25 cents a line or a dollar a line, whatever. So these things do happen. So um, I think more likely than not, the version of the poem that ended up in Longshot Poems is the original version, but he probably had to clean one up to get publication in the San Francisco Review. And he probably got paid for it. The poem itself, it's it's pretty funny. It predicts the lottery, which is amazing. Um, the spy plane line, I kind of dig. And it's a little bit of humor for a dark situation. And this is something Bukowski does a lot, too. And I don't know if this is something that the editors of putting these collections together like. But when he throws out little tidbits of current events, little, even though this poem is supposed to be a completely apolitical poem, him throwing out little tidbits of info like that, I think, um, shows his cultural awareness. As far as if I'm an editor putting this wild and crazy guy out, like, what are the things that I'm going to want people to see from him? Like, knowing that most of the people who buy my stuff are probably the intellectual crowd. Like, what am I trying to look for? Like, what do I want people to see? So, something like that completely makes sense. Conversation in a Cheap Room. Um, this was written around 1960. Um, I don't have dates on the ones prior to this. So this was written around 1960. Um, it's um, in, again, Longshot Poems here. Um, it's also in It Catches My Heart in Its Hands, 1963. A Bukowski Sampler in 69. Um, and The Rooming House Madrigals, again, from 1988. As far as magazines go, it was in the Galley Sale Review, Volume 2, Number 2, June 1960, and as far as recordings go, it's um, read on the poetry of Charles Bukowski from Pacifica Radio. I really like, but I could also see where people would criticize it. It's really good for setting the scene now. Now that you know that this guy is an intellectual, now that you know this guy has a social conscience, he's a drunk in a Skid Row hotel room. Okay, um, being entertained by the flame of lighter bouncing off the walls. 
knowing that his um, landlady wants the rent and he doesn't have it, knowing that there's probably not enough money around for more drink. Fucking death and beer here. There's a funny line that he says, um, the, the rat tails are as beautiful as the tails of young whores half drunk on wine. And then it makes you think, like, does that mean they're not very beautiful? Or was that just a clever line? It's a funny poem. It's good. I think that the thing that most critics and academia would give shit to this on is how all over the place it is. It's talking about this. It's talking about that. It's talking about this. It's talking about that. Oop, here's a metaphor. Taste this. Blah, 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 whatever. But my argument for this is, is that it's called conversation in a cheap room. So there will be things being said. Next, we have Death Wants More Death. This is one of his most famous poems, I think. Um, it comes up a lot when people are actually talking about Bukowski. So, uh, and this was written around 1957. This was in, obviously, Long Shot. Um, it's in Rooming House, page 92. Um, Run with the Hunted from 93. Not r the other Run with the Hunted, which we'll be talking about. Um, the Pleasures of the Damned um, from 2007. And then as far as like the magazines go, this was in Harlequin, volume two, number one from 1957. Why is Harlequin important? Because Harlequin's editor was Barbara Fry. Barbara Fry was Bukowski's wife. Um, they met through him submitting to Harlequin originally. Um, and that's a whole other story for a different day. Now this poem here, one of the things about it that's so cool, it's, it's about him as a child in the garage, seeing a spider and wanting to kill the spider being kind of scared that he might get caught killing the spider kind of thing. And so this whole thing, knowing what you know about Bukowski's past and his troubled childhood um, and the abuse from his father and the neglect from his mother, this action over the spider is like really like the only thing that he can control in his child child's world. Okay. And something like that probably didn't happen very often for him. So him being near 40, the fact that that image of that event can like shine so bright in his head, like something like that had to have had like a huge effect on him. So it's, um, it's really cool. And then the whole thing in, is, in, as a whole is an awesome metaphor. Next, we will go to Hello, Willie Shoemaker. And this was written around 1960. It's in Longshot. It's in a Bukowski sampler from 1969. And Rooming House, page 86 from 1988. Um, and this was also in the magazine Wrong, Wrong. Number one from 1960. I don't know how many um, of those kept coming out. I, I think this is the first I've heard of it. So this poem, now um, we're talking about the gambler, the working class hero. Um, it talks about Mary Lou in here. And, I'm, and I think, I think that Mary Lou or the idea of Mary Lou in here is the same as, um, I think it's Carmen in Factotum. I think that's what her name was in that. But, like, if you've read Factotum, the girl he was with in the boxcar, um, I think this is based off of the same person in his life. Um, and the other thing that's really weird about this poem is that this is one of the very few poems that has a happy ending. Like, where... It's almost like the end of a Conan story. Like he's like riding off into the sunset or um, something along those lines. So that's kind of kind of interesting. Next, we have Letter from the North. And this was again around 1960. 
It's from Long Shot Poems. Um, it was also in It Catches My Heart in Its Hands, and um, it's on page 120 of Rooming House. Um, this was also in Wrong, Wrong. Okay, this poem, though, um, Letter from the North, drives me crazy because it's a poem that talks about people, but you don't know who the people are. Now, if this was a Ginsburg poem, as you've been seeing on my channel lately, Ginsburg would be calling out everyone's first and last name, maybe their address, maybe their birthday, possibly their social security number. Pukowski, on the other hand, is just doing letters. So let's look at this real quick. Okay, so it's like, my friend writes a rejection from editors and how he has visited K or R or W. And I am in S number 12. He will have a poem in there. And T has written him from Florida, but rejected his poems. R sleeps in the print shop. So he's like saying all this shit. And I'm sitting here trying to rack my brain, trying to figure out who these people are. And I'm going through all this stuff. And then it dawns on me that it's quite possible he's using different initials. And if that's the case, I'm fucked. So another poem in here, which would probably make this 26, is um, parts of an opera, parts of a guitar, parts of nowhere um, that was in Long Shot and it's in Rooming House on page 118. Okay, this poem is very chunky in style. It's more of him just telling a story and um, the story is of him wanting to be educated and wanting to be that thing that he's not. I don't know if I like this inclusion into this book. It's fine in the sense that it shows he's the dreamer wanting the better life. You have to look at it, I think, as it being kind of a tongue-in-cheek thumb to nose kind of thing because he really never wanted that I think he wanted the money that came with that and the idea that people would probably leave him the fuck alone maybe yeah I think that poem and there's one other one that I'll talk about in a minute that I really think probably should not have been in this collection oh and it's the next poem Poem for Personal Managers. And this was written around 57. So it's in Long Shot Poems. And it's also in The Days Run Away Like Wild Horses Over the Hills. On page 25, I think. Um, it's in the 93 version of Run With The Hunted. Um, Heat Wave from 1995. Which I'm going to have to look up. I don't really know much about that book. Um, the Pleasures of the Damned from 2007. And then as far as magazines that it was in, it was in Coyote number 13 from 1957. This poem is too fucking long. Um, it It's long and... It's, it's very working class. It's good. But, um, I don't know, like, especially in a little stapled chapbook book, this feels really long. It's probably, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, it's like five or six pages long. So I don't know what it, what, how it was formatted in long shot. I don't know. Like, it, it's just too long for this, I think. Prayer for Broken-Handed Lovers. This is in, obviously, Long Shot. And then it's also on page 8 of Storm for, the, Storm for the Living and the Dead. And this looks nothing like something you would see him write as poetry, especially as time goes on. But, um... This is what that looks like there. And as you can see, this one, it's also a chunk. But yeah. In this, 
it's um I don't know. And um it was in Quicksilver number thirteen as well. Oh wait, no. Volume thirteen, number three. And also in the poetry of Charles Bukowski, Pacifica Radio. Um it this this poem is too chunky and a little too holy, if you catch my drift. So now we start picking up pace again with um kind of the more like what Bukowski's known for type of stuff. So next we have Riot. This is in Long Shot. Um, Days Run Away Like Wild Horses Over the Hills, and that, again, is from 1969. Um, the magazines that this appeared in was Quagga, Volume 1, Number 2, from 1960, and The Spectator, Volume 19, Number 7, released on March 18th in 1970. Um, and then, again, this was on the Poetry of Charles Bukowski CD. So yeah, again, this was in this guy here. And again, you can see the, the corner tags for the poems in this one. So this poem here, The Riot, um, it's the whole jailbird um, guy in the clink kind of thing with a, a good woman who loves him on the outside. And um, as we pretty much can assume this woman is the woman from St. Louis, I think. And I don't think um, there was any real romance between the two of them. So more of wishful thinking here. So the next poem is So Much for the Knifers, So Much for the Bellowing Dawns. So this was in... Um, long shot poems obviously and um the only other place this showed up was um nomad volume five and six a double issue from 1960 and this poem's funny i'll put it up here it's it's like a funny rejection slip poem which is something um he has done quite a bit but the uh, what do you call it the bio the short bio piece for him in this magazine is talking about how he doesn't understand why academia is up his ass about how he does shit. Like, why the fuck should they care? And he says, like, just because you see somebody living and have a good time, you have to go shit all over him. Um, don't quote me on the exact verbiage, but that was about what it was. Um, so that was pretty good. I liked that. Uh, yes, the next poem, The Ants, written around 61. Um, the only other place you could find this in book form is in Rooming House Madrigals. Um, as far as magazines go, um, this was in Signet, Volume 3, Number 12, from 1961, in New York. Volume 1, number 17, from 1967. And um, a great title of a magazine, Mag. Number 4, the Summer 72 issue. And for, as far as recordings go, um, the poetry of Charles Bukowski. Um, this poem is interesting because, especially around this time when he wrote this, what do we have here? Like around 60, 61. Um, he's, he's the suicide. The guy, the suicide kid. The guy who's always about to kill himself. And in this, it just shows you that that was all bullshit. Because in this poem where ants are crawling up on him. And he's just watching them go. Watching them communicate. And all this shit. Then he's like, oh my god, they're going to kill me. They're going to eat me. And he completely, he's like, not today, Satan. And he fucking knocks all the ants off of him and gets up and runs. Okay. That's not, and again, it's a poem. It's probably funny, the whole fucking thing. But it just, it's strange. I think he showed his hand a little bit there. So the next one, the best way to get famous is to run away. This poem is well, let, let me tell you where it is. Um, 
it's also in the Bukowski sampler from 69 rooming house and the essential poetry or the essential Bukowski, um, that came out in 2016. It was in the San Francisco review number eight from 61. And it's also on the poetry of Charles Bukowski. This is probably the best piece about fame that he ever wrote. The structure of this again is not what he would be known for as far as structure goes. But the idea that him, how how does this poem start off? I found a loose slab outside the ice cream store, tossed it aside and began to dig. The earth was soft and full of worms. And soon I was up to my waist, size 36, and a crowd gathered. And basically all these people are coming, watching him, trying to figure out why the fuck he's digging. And he keeps digging, and he keeps digging, and more and more people come. The cops come. The media comes. They're trying to figure out what the fuck's going on. Why is this happening? He finally comes out, and he gets arrested. But while he's in jail, he finds out that he has a book deal now to talk about why he did what he did. Um, There are people who want him on late-night talk shows to talk about, like, why he was digging. And he's like... And as soon as I get out of this jail cell, I'm going to find another loose slab and I'm going to start digging again and I'm not coming out. So the whole idea here is, is that the more you try to distance yourself from fame, like the more it comes after you. But I will say to play a little devil's advocate here, um, you could have just dug a hole in your backyard You know, you didn't need to go in front of the ice cream store surrounded by a bunch of motherfuckers and start digging. If you really didn't want anyone to find you, you could have just went somewhere where there was no one around and then started digging. So, again, I think it's a little, a little different, a little different than how it really is. Okay. Next, the day I kicked a bankroll out the window. This is written around 59. Um, It's here in Longshot. Um, Also a Bukowski sampler from 69. On Love from 2016. And Essential Bukowski from 2016. As far as magazines go, it was in Quicksilver, Volume 12, Number 2, released in 1959. And again on the poetry of Charles Bukowski CD. Um, and this is just like the, the tough guy lover poem. So where, where's, uh, on love here. This book feels so good. These, these books feel great. He's a, he's a super like tough motherfucker until the chick's like, okay, beat it. And he's like, Oh baby, no baby. Oh, and does all that shit, and then goes to the whole, like, oh, I'll never understand women. Da, 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 da. So it's just, it's a ridiculous kind of comical um, dig at um, the woman that he just divorced. So there's, there's that, too. Because I'm sure he thought she would see this book, and she would read this poem, so... There's that. And then we have The Japanese Wife, a poem from about 1960. This one made its rounds. It was in um, this, obviously. It was also in It Catches My Heart in Its Hands from 1963. Um, Rooming House from 88 and The Pleasures of the Damned from 2007. Um, As far as magazines go, it was in Target's number three from 1960. And as far as recordings go, it's finally on a different one. Um, 90 Minutes in Hell, the LP from Earth Books, which was Steve Richmond's thing from 1977. And then um, in 1997, a bootleg of this came out um, called 70 Minutes in Hell. And I think the difference between the two is that 90 Minutes in Hell has him reading like in his apartment. And then there's um, the bit of the Bellevue poetry reading, the Bellevue poetry reading in Washington. 
like rounds that out. So 70 minutes in hell just cuts out the Bellevue stuff. Anyway, so this poem, The Japanese Wife, um, is kind of talking about how um, American women are shit compared to Japanese women and all this other shit. But I honestly don't think that's really what this is about. And I think this is mainly about Jane. Um, and Because when he gets to the part about like the wallpaper in the bottom of the drawers, I think that's what he is referring to when he's referring to the Japanese wife. Um, and just missing Jane, um, because Jane had been dead quite a while at this point. Okay, next we have The Life of Baroden, and this was written around 1958. Um, so we have Long Shot Poems, It Catches My Heart in Its Hands from 1963, Bukowski Sampler from 69, and we have a new addition into this one. Um, it's also in Burning in Water, Drowning in Flame from 1974, and the essential Bukowski from 2016. Now, to be fair, Burning in Water, Drowning in Flame is a collection of four um, Bukowski books, okay? Well, selections from four Bukowski books, which would be um, It Catches My Heart in Its Hands, Crucifix in a Death Hand, and At Terror Street in Agony Way, and then plus Burning in Water, Drowning in Flame. Yep, it's from the section with It Catches My Heart in Its Hands. So, um, we're, we're kind of doubling up right there, but that's fine, that's fine. This is also in Quicksilver, Volume 11, Number 3, from 1958. And then, this is on quite a few recordings. So, this is on Hello, It's Good to Be Back, um, releases an LP in 1978, which I think is from a German record label. Um, then the Hello, It's Good to Be Back CD from 2008, same record label. And then um, the Thomas Schmidt film, 1978 Hamburg Reading, which um, was never commercially released um, around 2015. So this here, we have, um, we're talking about Broden, who lived a horrible life with a horrible wife that um, led him to death. But, um, but, 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 it will, sh it shows you Bukowski's sophistication, okay? As long as you assume that knowledge of classical music equates to sophistication, this is the thing about Bukowski that has always just boggled my mind. For someone who constantly wanted to just be like, fuck the system, fuck you, fuck your fucking colleges, fuck your professors, the whole fucking thing. He seemed to go out of his way to show all those people that they were wrong for not considering him one of them. You see what I'm saying? Like, this is something that comes up in his work so much. And especially his work pre-1980. Like, as much as he, like, yells and screams that he's an individual and all this shit... I honestly think he never shook the fact that he was picked last or second to last on the baseball team and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Um, I think that really the, the, the need for ex being accepted <sighs> kind of outweighed his need for um, anything else really. But then because his social skills were so piss poor, actually, I'm not even going to go down that road because I think by that time he was believing his own myth. Um, but I think like, especially like the like late fifties through the sixties or at least halfway through the sixties, I think he still thought or hoped that he would be accepted kind of deal um i think by the time the 70s rolled around 
his myth kind of carried him where it needed to carry him. But at the same time, he still missed what he wanted. But then by the time the 80s rolled around, I think he was like, you know what? I'm good. And when we get to the 80s, we'll see how often he dips back into this well to see if I'm wrong about this. So we'll, we'll come back to that. Okay, next, The Loser from 1960. This was in Longshot, Bukowski Sampler, Rooming House Magicals, um, the 1993 version of Run with the Hunted, and Essential Bukowski from 2016. Um, this played in a couple different magazines. We have The Sparrow, at number 14, from 1960, Mindscapes from 1972, and Graffiti Rag from 1995, as well as a recording of this um, for the poetry of Charles Bukowski, Charles Bukowski Pacifica Radio um, from 2008. Um, this poem is fun because it's to him showing that poetry is more of a fight than boxing. And there are quite a few boxing poems um, in Bukowski's repertoire, okay? Um, but the idea that poetry is a harder fight and a tougher fight than boxing is hysterical. Next, we have poem... No, wait. The State of World Affairs from a Third Story Window, um, around, written around 1960. The thing that cracks me up about this is that around this time, he lived pretty close to where I'm living right now. In fact, if you look out this window, nope, this window, you can, I'm like 500 feet from a building that he used to live in, okay? And I didn't know that when I moved here. I found that out after I fucking moved in here, which is bonkers. Next, in this poem, he talks about um, seeing the Hollywood Hills out his window, out this window, I could see that. I could see the Hollywood sign and the Griffith Observatory right there. Boom. Um, and I am on the third floor, and that is a third floor window. So this this poem, it just cracks me up. But um, anyway, so this is in Long Shot, of course. It catches my heart in its hands. Bukowski Sampler, burning in water, drowning in flame. Heat Wave again from 1995. I got to figure out what the hell that book is. An Essential Bukowski um, from 2016. Um, this was also in that Wrong Wrong number one from 1960 and Libri number four from 1966. And this is on um, the King Mob CD at Terror Street and Agony Way from 1998 and also um, on Bukowski Reads His Poetry CD that Black Sparrow put out in 2004. So I love this poem um, because especially now knowing I'm in kind of the same little world here it's um, kind of bizarre. And this poem was always kind of funny to me but I had forgotten about this poem for some time until reading for this stuff came up and I like was like holy shit holy shit this is what is endearing about him to me he's waiting for inspiration he's looking for inspiration he's looking out the windows he's trying to find something to fucking inspire him and the only thing he can see is a woman trying to walk her dog and get her dog to go to the bathroom but her dog's constipated this is all he has to be inspired by. That would make most people not fucking write anything, but he wrote something anyway. And the kicker here, he does this a lot too, and I really want to encourage all writers out there to do this, especially when you're writing off of just like mundane observations. He, he throws the fear of the bomb into this. He throws in something that is actually going on. And he does this a lot of times through stuff, through short stories and stuff. He'll be talking about the fight a husband and wife are having, but he'll also let you know that Nixon's the president 
or something like that. Like he just throws in these little nuggets of um, factoids or fears or current events that usually date a poem. But if it's something that people can relate to, who fucking cares if it dates the poem? If it's something where a bunch of people who also fear the bomb are reading this and go, ooh, I fear the bomb. Because that was a big fucking thing. Drop the fucking bomb. Or like, I hope the bomb doesn't drop. That was something that always was a fucking issue in the 50s and 60s. So um, it just, it cracks me up that he throws that in there too. Okay, The Sun Wields Mercy, a poem from 1960. Again, let's talk about all the places it's been. Long Shot Poems. Catches My Heart in Its Hands. Rooming House Madrigals, and then it's also in this um, Penguin Modern Poets number 13, page 32. Um, and then as far as magazines go, um, this was in um, Epos, volume 12, number 2 from 1960. Now, this poem is super fucking depressing, but one that I'm sure the academics would praise him for. So... With that said, I'm sure that was helpful. Early in his career, I feel like he tried to write more poems that he thought would get him a bit of street cred among the college professors. And to be honest, it fucking did. Because if you remember, um, Corrington like, championed him. Watling championed him. There were quite a few people teaching like poetry or lit in college um there was someone out here actually i don't know but like he had these weird pockets across the country of professors who thought he was fucking brilliant and it was probably him doing things like this and yes i don't or no i don't think he's like i need people to like me so i'm gonna write a poem like this but i'm just saying it's funny that after a period, he never really wrote like this again. He writes like this early in his career, and then once he gets the fame and the notoriety, he doesn't do that anymore. And so because he stopped doing that, or stopped doing it so much like this, I really, really feel that this wasn't his true way. And again, people change with age, they go through different cycles and all this other stuff, so maybe I'm full of shit. But it's just one of those weird things to point out. And then probably one of the one of the most famous, especially f the most famous early period Bukowski poem um, is in here next, The Tragedy of the Leaves, which we have talked about before. Um, again, this was written around 1960. It was in a signature of Charles Bukowski, um, long shot poems. It catches my heart in its hands. A Bukowski sampler. Burning in water, drowning in flame. Um, Run with the hunted from '93. Pleasures of the damned and essential Bukowski. As far as magazines go, like we said last time, this one made the rounds. Um, it was in Targets, number four, 1960. Outsider, number three, 1963. Florida Education, volume 42, number nine, from May '65. Z, an anthology of revolutionary poetry from 1968, California Bicentennial Poets Anthology from 1976. Um, and then as far as the recordings go, this was on the Bukowski tapes from 87, A Terror Street in Agony Way from 98, Bukowski Reads His Poetry from 04, the Bukowski tapes DVD from 2006, and Poetry of Charles Bukowski again pacifica radio 2008 if you want to know more about the tragedy of the leaves and my thoughts on it go back and watch a signature of charles bukowski um that's i think the second video in this little series here next to the horror who took my poems this was written in 1960 it was in long shot catch my heart in his hands bukowski sampler burning water draining flame on love and essential bukowski it was in Quagga, again, I can't pronounce words, which that might not even be a word. Volume 1, number 3, 1960, and on the Pacifica Radio Poetry of Charles Bukowski recording. 
this is <clears throat> a plea for help. And I like the bit in here where he's like, look, I know poetry is supposed to be abstract. I don't give a fuck. This chick took all my shit. And um, then it has like his fucking jab at modern poetry through this whole thing, which is just hysterical. The idea that he doesn't know how many more poems he has in him. Like, don't take, don't take my fucking poems. I really don't know if I could ever write another one again. Like, please, what the fuck are you doing? It's so good. Truth's a hell of a word. This was in um, Long Shot Poems and Catches My Heart in Its Hands. And it was also in the magazine A Flash of Pasadena, number five from 1967. This poem, so basically this poem has not been released in any of the Black Sparrow collections. This hasn't been released in any of the Echo collections. Um, this has not been released by City Lights. It was in this chapbook and the Lujan Press, It Catches My Heart in Its Hands. And that book sells for thousands and thousands of dollars, okay? And it's in The Flash of Pasadena. This is a fucking beautiful poem and I can't believe that it hasn't been collected more. $50 million worth of flowers cannot cover the graves or the errors of men who thought they were doing good, but were all backwards and killing and wailing for death from their first breath to their last. Now, nobody likes a preacher, even when they think, yes, yes, he's preaching the truth. But the truth's a funny thing. From the bloodied poppies of Flanders to the bulge that ended in the snow, melting in clarity for strafing? Strafing? I don't know. And bombing out the long, thin strings of supply lines, or Rome taking the best of Greece and passing it to the Huns who spit it out. Truth? Truth is a hell of a word used by everybody and everything. I think even sometimes the grasshoppers use truth. Although they get caught up on it, they are closer than we. I thank God that the hummingbird was built large enough to escape the spider's web. I thank God for woman, and perhaps even for the bomb, that is large enough to blow some of us or all of us away. For when the truth becomes too large or too tough, evil becomes truth and truth becomes evil. And the good spinning of our lives in the fire and Milton's fallen angels dulled by the lake of fire will someday rise and change back the stream. And I hear the sirens of the streets now, little guns of little men, Bertine spark and a woman goes by in torridor pants, her crotch too tight for seeming. And I lift my glass and drink, too tough for good. And I see the spit and the flame and cussing, Hannibal slapping his elephant's ass and the hummingbird spinning free. And every day there's need to say less and drink more. Okay, after reading that poem, it's kind of stumbly. There are some stumbly words in there. Um, kind of clunky. But knowing how John Martin did whatever the fuck he wanted to with Bukowski's work after Bukowski died, I'm shocked that this poem hasn't found its way into one of those collections. Next, What a Man I Was from 1959. This is in the days run away like wild horses over the hills and the pleasure of the damned as well. Um, as far as magazines, it was in Gallows number one in 59 and Caterpillar number eight in 69, and also on the Pacifica Radio CD. Um, this is just a funny, childish outlaw fantasy that has him as like an outlaw cowboy getting hung because he's so damn good and so damn special. Um, it's, it's fun, it's a fun poem. Next, when Hugo Wolf went mad. This was written around 59. Um, and this is in quite a few books. Um, a Bukowski sampler, Days Run Away, Pleasures of the Damned, and Essential Bukowski. Um, and it was in Odyssey Magazine, volume 11, number 1 from 1959, and Pardon, or Pardon um, volume 15, number 6 from June 76. 
Um, as far as the recordings go, it's on Hello, It's Good to Be Back from 78 and 2008. Uh, Solid Citizen CD from 2004 and the unreleased Hamburg Reading. And this poem's cool because it's he's talking about somebody else. He's talking about Hugo Wolf, but I think the analogy or the metaphor is that this is what's going to happen to him here. So someday he'll be famous, but not before he goes mad and still can't pay the rent. That's the moral of the story here. It's pretty good. Um, so where the hell would Chopin be? This one's actually pretty good too. Um, and this, as far as books go, was only in long shot poems, never released anywhere else. Um, it was, however, in Beatitude, number 16 from 1960. And this is one of those ramble at the end of the ramble of the end of the world poems. And he, he does this a lot. And um, the rambling, just like in that one I read you a second ago, it goes kind of all over the place, but he'll try to bring it back. In fact, that one I read you before, the hummingbird, um, he wants to thank God for the hummingbird being too big to get caught in the spider's web. That's gorgeous stuff. I fucking absolutely love that line. This one's kind of the same, um, but he hits on this a lot, the ramble for the end of the world kind of deal. Um, and that takes us to the last poem in this collection, Winter Comes in a Lot of Places in August from 1959. So, long shot poems, Catch My Heart in His Hands, Rooming House, Madrigals, and fucking Heat Wave again. I got to figure out what this fucking Heat Wave book is. I, I don't think I've ever heard of it before now. Um, and then as far as magazines go, this was in Nomad Volume 1 from 1959. Um, recordings, it's on A Terror Street in Agony Way, and Bukowski Reads His Poetry. This poem is, um, for it not really being in, like, Rooming House is probably the most popular book it was in. And that was from 88. It, I just would have figured this poem had been in a lot more places but maybe i've just read it a lot in rooming house but it's like the working class together fighting the man looking at your 40 hour a week job as going to war it's cold and depressing but the whole idea the whole reason why people the whole reason why people still do this shit is because it's a validation of their manhood and um a bunch of other depressing crap so that's that's the book. That is long shot poems for blo for bleh, broke players. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, let me know down below what you think. If you actually have a copy of this, because I think copies for this are going for around four thousand. Probably you might be able to pull it off for thirty five, but I would say probably realistic would be in between thirty five and fifty five hundred for um, an original copy of this. And I thought this was a pretty low run, but in the ad that, um, and I guess I'll put that here and we could look at it because it's kind of funny. An ad that Carl Larson made up acting like it was a angry letter from some religious organization. Um, and then halfway through, he kind of gives up on the scam and says, nope, this is actually an advertisement, you know, whatever. Um, I'll put it here. It's pretty funny. But this says like something like 12,000 copies of this were made. If that's the case, uh, I, I don't know why these are so expensive. And maybe that's me just being thick. But um, 12,000 is quite a few. And yes, it was 50 fucking years ago. But still, like... Oh, wait, no. 60 fucking years ago now. Jesus. Yeah, maybe. Maybe 12,000 copies doesn't really go that far. I don't know. We'll see. If you have a copy of this, take a picture of it and send it to me. I'd love to see it. Um, and if you want to give it to me because you're sweet, do that. Or if you want to sell it to me for a reasonable price, hit me up about that too. So until next time, everybody, I will talk to you later. Bye-bye. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.